Welcome everyone to WHAS Television Web Product One on One with Larry Bissig. We're glad to be here today with none other than Governor John Y. Brown. Governor, thank you for joining us today. It's a heck of an honor. Put it there, baby. Larry, good to see you. I'm yes, glad sir. to see you. Uh, disclosure, I met uh, Governor Brown in uh, 1983, and I've had the opportunity to work with him uh, since that time. A little bit of this, a little bit of that, but I've always been a student of Governor Brown, and I'm anxious to educate people a little bit more about uh, the history of this great Kentuckian and what he's done. So thank you for joining us. I wanted to, right. Governor, jump in. Uh, your youth is something that uh, I think is, is important for uh, Kentuckians and people across the viewing area to understand. Um, your father was S Speaker of the House. Yes. He was a congressman. Right. And he was in the House of Representatives for right. over 20 years. Mm -hmm. What was it like growing up in a political household like that? And, and, and did that, was that a major influence on you? Well, that's all I ever talked to me about is politics. <clears throat> Someday I want you to do what I couldn't do. And uh, he was a great, he was a, you know, grew up in a farming community. He couldn't do in terms of, he ran well, for governor? Yeah, he ran for everything. Yeah. And okay. uh, he was a, a game changer. Uh, he didn't go along with the politicians. And he was a, uh, Banyan Rooster. I mean, he liked a good fight and was a great speaker and wanted to change things. And, and uh, he was a great influence on me. He gave me the motivation to try to reach out and do the best that I could. And, and uh, never, he never talked to me about girls or sex or, or, or religion. You know, he just wants you to go out and do the best you can, what you got to work with. And Was it true that he wanted you to uh Bail hay with the football team instead of selling encyclopedias during the summer. Is that, is that ringing no, the bells? No, he got me a job on the state highway, and to pay a dollar an hour. I asked him one day. I said, "Dad, this isn't for me." And then I learned how to sell. I started selling uh, vacuum cleaners in high school, and uh, and you know I went out football, basketball, golf swimming. I wasn't very good. I was a pretty good golfer. I uh, had the best chance to really sort of prove myself selling Encyclopedia Britannica. And that was all and through law school? All through, no, it was through uh, undergraduate work, freshman, sophomore. They made me feel like I was going to be selected. Well, they would have hired anybody off the streets. And they gave me that kit, and I memorized whatever the pitch was. And my first weekend after I was trained, to tell you the truth, I sold five sets of Encyclopedia Britannica. made $500, which was an enormous amount of money back in those days. And it gave me something I could excel in, and I learned how to judge people, how to read people, how to get them to like you or listen to you. And Let me ask you quickly, uh, you practiced with your father. You, you did law together for, yeah. a, for a little bit, and then it, did you, were you looking at a barbecue scenario, or were there some barbecue no, toys? No, you know, in my era, you grow up and do what your dad did, usually. And, and I never thought about anything else about it. I guess I'll be a lawyer because my dad's a lawyer. And uh, I went to law school and I, graduated from I Kentucky. Graduated Kentucky, and then I practiced law for about a year. And my brother-in-law, the name of the firm was Brown and Son, like both fathers and son. We practiced together, and uh, he was a little bit jealous that uh, I came in the firm and straight out of law school. And he called me in his office and said, "You know, people around town are talking about you riding your dad's coattails." So I said, well, the hell with that. So I went to Dad. I said, look, Dad, I'm going to Louisville. I'll practice law over there. and I'm going to use your name as Brown and Father. It's not going to be Brown and Son. I'm going to be the big banana over there. I got a little bored after a year and a half and realized that I wanted to do something more advantageous or more stimulating for me and, and the way I was looking forward to whatever my life was going to be. And, uh, I got on a political program with Ned Breathitt. He had an office down here at the Sealback Hotel when he ran against Happy Chandler. And I was one of the few people that came in to volunteer in his campaign. So he made me a speaker's chairman. And I was on WHAS uh, TV uh, on a, a talk show. I was a moderator like you are today. And Colonel Sanders called me uh, after the show, wanted to hire me as a lawyer. And I said, Colonel, I don't know anything about real estate law. And I didn't go see him for six months. I didn't know what he did. I'd met him before with his restaurant in Corbin. But uh, and I had no idea even what he's doing, selling chicken. And he went through all these files. He had these licenses where he'd make $100 a month or 150 some of them $200 a month. He had like 600 licenses where he'd go to a restaurant and 
go in there and say, buddy, let me cook you some chicken. If you like it, I'll give you a license. And over a period of years, he had like 600 of these little uh, licenses where you just an item on the menu. And that put the bucket out when it got to be popular. So uh, that day, he said, uh, Johnny, uh, why don't you drive over and I want to start a barbecue franchise. And uh, we went over to Pink Pig in Frankfurt, and, and I got sort of fascinated being around him, wearing a white suit and all that. And then that night in Lexington, he had a place. Uh, I went by and tried his chicken. I said, oh, this is fascinating. I said, I'm going to find a place around here. This looks too good to be true. And so I talked him into being, I'd be his partner and open up the barbecue uh, franchise. Uh, you remember Ellie, my first wife, that she did the curtains and we had barrel furniture and a big pit and opened like a big barbecue place, but we called it uh, uh, the Porky Pig, but also put the bucket out there. What we found out when we opened, uh, we did 80% chicken, 20% barbecue. So we found out we were in the wrong end of the right business. <laughs> And I didn't have any money, and, and uh, Ellie's uh, friend, a girlfriend in college, there, she and her husband were moving from Nashville to Louisville, and said, go by and say hello to him. And so I paid the courtesy, and he got fascinated with uh, what I was doing. His, and name? He knew, his name was Jim Cavanaugh, and he knew someone in uh, Nashville. His dad was a mortgage banker, and he knew someone that had just retired uh, from a business and had a little finance company. So he sent me up here to talked to me about finance my first store. So I got lucky and we became good friends and uh, Jack Massey was his name and ultimately we became partners. And Massey invested. And, and, and Massey Investment Company. And uh, I introduced the Colonel to do the financing for the Colonel. I Two million dollars in today's money was what the record is indicating that Massey put into your concept at the time. Well, no, we, we ended up buying the Colonel out. And yes, that sir. Was, he, that was a hard task. And because, Massey backed you, backed you. Yeah, and we were partners, and he put up the money. I didn't have any money, and we had a 60-40 deal, and had a handshake, and we had a, a beautiful partnership. But we were rocking and rolling and working seven days a week and doing whatever necessary to keep pushing forward. But it was an experience of a lifetime and gave me an opportunity that few people have. And... Uh, I give the credit to the man in the white suit because he had the recipe. I got him on TV about 30 times over about a four-year period, and he was a showman, you know. Had a sixth-grade education. He, was, he, really, he really helped change the eating habits of the world, if you think about it. All out of a little recipe and restaurants, and we started building take-homes. We took it out of restaurants and just built our own facilities, and there's 17,000 of them now all over the world, and it hadn't changed much. It's the same concept we developed back in in the mid-60s. So Unbelievable. We didn't know any better. I think it's the reason why. It, you didn't know what you didn't know. No, I didn't know what we didn't know. That's right. Question. Um, I want to go through a litany of some folks that you've worked with either in government or in uh, business yes. and, and point out some things to the viewers that they may not know. George Baker founded Mr. Gaddy's Pizza. Uh, Bruce Lunsford founded Kindred right next door. Uh, Ron Geary founded Rest Care, based here in Louisville. A uh, billion and a half dollar company. These, Both of them. What did these folks all have in common that 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 inspired you to? Re well, and we were talking uh, about Larry Townsend, yeah, uh, who also was a player in his own right. Well, what, they all what, had high what? goals. They were hard, hard workers, had good good brain power, good thought pattern, and good integrity. Uh, George Baker was I hired out of college. I didn't know who to hire. I hired a bunch of guys I went to school with. And uh, George ended up as being my number one guy and uh, ran all the company-owned stores, did a great job. Uh, I know we owned 600 stores. I wondered, we were moving to Louisville. We had a big headquarters, a big white column building out there. And uh, I went to see George's new offices, thinking he had a whole part of that half floor of offices because he run all these stores all over the country. He had two people working for him. <laughs> had a marketing person and a secretary. And I said, George, where's your organization? He said, it's all delegated. I delegated. I got Omaha runs your stores, Dallas runs your stores, and he taught me all about managing. Keep it simple, you know. And that's what we did at KFC. We kept it simple. Uh, the KIS, uh, keep it simple, stupid. Uh, that was our motto back then. Let's so, talk politics if we can, Governor. Uh, Steve Bashir, uh, yeah, I know that uh, there was a time when you were not big on uh, the former governor. I know that you were the only governor that did not attend his first inauguration, yeah. but then you did come 
for his second inauguration. Right. What's the nature of that relationship with him now? Well, I got involved in because I didn't like it. My dad couldn't win, and we didn't have anything to do with any politicians. Uh, I just didn't like all the things they do. It's basically corrupt off and on over the years, and I'm not saying anything out of school, because I get along with all of them, try to. And I was upset when I ran against Brashear the second time. He used his whole uh, marketing uh, budget uh, just to say I raised taxes. You know, that's just the way marketing was, but I've never been used to being around environments where you don't tell the truth and you tell the, this truth. Because we, didn't, we had a great administration. I mean, we were only one of uh, five states around us. All five of them raised sales tax, corporate tax, personal income tax. We didn't raise any tax. I had all people smarter than I was. I had, you know, really successful people that wanted to make a difference in the state, and they did. And we had a great time. And we ran it like a business, because it is a business. And every aspect of it, and uh, even the Courier Journal said we were wholly honorable and effective in an unfavorable yes. economy. And so I was so proud of that opportunity. But it was all because we didn't like politics, and we wanted to change it, we did change it. Do you Unfortunately, see it, it went back, but. Uh, Steve, I, I admired the way he uh, worked, and we got a chance to get to know each other a little better. I, I forgave him on it, uh, because all politics are that way. I just didn't like the way they'll, well, look at all the politics now. They'll say anything and everything gets, to, and your reputation is the most important thing you ever have in your lifetime. And I just wasn't used to that and didn't like it. So uh, it's no I don't get mad at people. That's about the only thing I've ever done where I was sort of uh, angry about it. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of parallels between, it's no secret I'm, I'm a fan of Governor Bevin, there's a lot of parallels in terms of what he's up against budget-wise and what yeah. you are up against budget-wise. Right. What can you tell us about the uh, uh, pension reform process and did you face that? What, what was pension reform like when you were governor and how did it get to where it got? Well, the governors over the last 20 years, as I understand, the ones that got out of hand and borrowing from it, not really supporting uh, the credibility of what the promise was under those uh, pension funds. But I admire Governor Bevin. He's doing the right thing. You got to pay your bills. If you lose your financial credibility in the marketplace, then you put yourself that much further behind. He's got a tough challenge. I admire the way he's uh, attacking it. It's not easy. I'm disappointed in the media. They want to make every little cut like someone's going to die, we can't survive, we'll survive. And these are tough times, and it's time for tough decisions. And he's a Republican, and I, I think he's a talent, and I think he's trying to do the right thing. I don't agree with him on some of the philosophical issues, different between Republicans and Democrats, but I want to see him do well. I don't care about Kentucky. And parties mean nothing anymore. There's a dynamic that's at work recently in the last two governors that I want to ask if you faced. The dynamic is the attorney general going after the existing governor for political purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, Andy Bashir, it seems like, does nothing but look for opportunities to go after Governor Bevin, which is disappointing. Uh, Stumbo, may, maybe it cost him his seat, uh, did nothing but go after Ernie Fletcher all day long. Who was the attorney general when you were governor, and were you all in lockstep, or did, did you have an attorney general going after you every time you made a move? Well, Steve Brashear was attorney general. Okay. We didn't problem with anybody. Just wanted to come in there and do the right thing, and it's not complicated. Probably the easiest job I've ever had, because you don't have to make a profit, and you don't have any competition. You just do the right thing, and it's amazing all the good things you can do. So we, were, we all enjoyed it. The... Uh, Situation with your daughter. She is White House correspondent yeah, for senior, CNN. Senior, senior, Excuse senior, me, senior White old. House correspondent. Yeah. That's Pamela Brown. Uh, you one time told me that uh, one of the best feelings on earth is seeing your uh, sibling, or excuse me, your son or your daughter on national television. It's got oh, to feel great. Tell me about that. Well, what I like about her is she doesn't take herself seriously, but she's really good. She works hard. I did nothing to motivate her. I didn't know being fellas and daughters enough of a challenge is. What do you tell your daughter to do? And I just want her to be happy like most fathers would. Sons are different. You know, you want to make your vote them to reach out as I did with John and uh, my son, younger son, Lincoln. But uh, she just went to North Carolina. Uh, they have a good communication school. The head of the school called me over and said, Governor, 
your daughter was the hardest worker in school. Mm. I said, oh boy, because I, you know, none of us are geniuses. If you work harder, you're going to get further down the road than anybody you compete with. And to me, it's the most important element that you'll have in being successful. The Five renovation million, of Freedom Hall was your responsibility. Million dollars, cost $11 million. And then he said it was the finest arena at that time in the United States. And at that time, I think Mayor Sloan ever talked about a $175 million arena. I said, no way. And I got an architect that kept working and working, finally came up with a plan. And as you know, you went to many games out there. It was a great arena at its time. And now Jim Host came in and revolutionized downtown Louisville, I think. I think that and the Kentucky Center for the Arts are two of the really landmarks uh, for, for Louisville. I think you've moved up to where they're very competitive with other similar markets. And you think about, I've been very fortunate, uh, Larry, uh, that I've been closely associated with two of the most famous people in the world, both of them from right here in Kentucky. That's Ali Muhammad Ali and, and Colonel Sanders. That's right. And if you think of them over the years, I don't know if anyone's more famous than old Colonel. Man in the white suit, if you put him on a pasteboard and you put three or four presidents on, they'd know the man in the white suit. And Ali was, uh, and Larry Towns the one that built the center with Lonnie, and then Anna Bonds come in and and we're having a board meeting today. That's one reason I'm over here. Yeah. But, uh, uh, I don't think Anna Bond got the credit that she deserved for well, she what she put into she, that oh, uh, she museum. Has. And, and Larry, too. Larry gave six years and didn't draw a salary. He built the foundation, raised $80 million uh, after 9 11. You know, uh, it's, a, it's a great country. Uh, and Ali is what a, what a great role model. And his legacy. Well, he passed away. We've never had a figure in the world. Governor Brown, thank you so much. Yes, sir. You bet. You've been watching One on One with Larry Bissig on WHAS Television and WHAS.com. See you soon.